This is our second section on the 1920s. This one is a lot more interesting. Um, I'm not going to spend as much time on this video as I do in class as we go over things and usually about a week as it's split up uh, in class with the other side stories. Uh, this, one thing about this is it's more interesting side uh, of it, of the history for the 20s than our last section. Um, but if you look at the standards, you're not going to see a whole lot of this that will usually be tested directly um, on the state standards like they are on the, the first section with more of the political and the economic side for the, for the 20s. Um, the one flat side that you will de definitely have a question, you notice standard 5.6, where you see Hollywood, Harlem Renaissance, fundamentalist movement, prohibition. Um, so no, no, you'll have one question along with that, but you won't have as many with there. We come back to Marcus Garvey and some of the things that we had had before that there could be questions too. Uh, doesn't mean that it's not important. In fact, actually, this to me it's really important just because state standards don't don't have it. So that's why we spend just as much, if not more, time on this section um, during during um, class than what we did on the last section. Even the last section would have had a lot more questions that are probably going to be on your on your EOC. Again, 1920s for your bracketing date. Stock market crash will end with, with that time period. All right, urbanization. This is where we kind of are continuing from what we had from Unit 6 and Unit 7, where we America changes. We become a lot more based on um, cities. The 1920 census was the first time that we have more people living in the cities than the country um, with that, that census. This is where, where when the beginning of one of our sections that we had industrialization, I had the slide and what's different in 40 years and how much the change. So if we were to, to go and say, say ha what happened 40 years ago, really there's not, we've made a lot of changes, but for America, if we were to go back to 1981, um, it's not as dramatic as you think of how d different it was. But from 1921, you go, the changes that have been made since 1881 were extremely dramatic from horse and buggy to cars and and um, airplanes from candlelight to to electricity I mean as entertainment I mean all around all those changes a short period of time are going to have a lot of conflicts um, there is the between the urban and the rural the changes there modern traditional science and religion we're all seeing different things that we have we can see this where politically there are changes that are done. The Republican and Democratic Party, a lot of th ideas that we have today, we're starting at that time. Um, conservative liberal will actually flip in some of the ideological stances that we have um, there. We, where we study the KKK in the last section and where it rises up, that's some of that backlash that you have um, there with the changes. So, and this is some of it's going to be generational. And the difference that you have that you have to think about is one generation um, even here. All right, we had prohibition before, and this is where you need to know the 18th Amendment um, was, the, was passed to, that would outlaw alcohol. Now, the Volstead Act was the actual law that will go and place it, said you could not buy, sell, or transport. You were able to make it for yourself for your own consumption uh, there. Now, we talked before and, and when we had prohibition and the 18th Amendment and the progress fair of why it came about. Um, for the noble experiment, and I, so I say, do these reasons work? And as we went through through the list, you will see that almost all the reasons worked. Um, there, there, where you had a lot of women that were saying that we needed to have it um, there, whether it be spouse abuse, men spending their money on alcohol, those things all helped. Um, there, we will see that happiness factor in marriage actually goes up um, during the 1920s. We will find that that for where where employers were wanting to, and factory owners were wanting to have, have prohibition. And what they were saying would happen did happen. We had a lot less people that, that were absentee, productivity went up, there was less accidents on the draw, job, so that happened. Where a lot of criminal um, prosecutors and police were wanting to have prohibition, this is where we get to the tricky spot because yes, the crimes that we had before went down, less murder, less assault, less burglary, less everything pretty much when it comes to crime, but crime as a whole went up. And this is where eventually the noble experiment of prohibition will fail um, here because, and this is where the negative effect, you see the picture there, 
of Al Capone, but the negative effect is organized crime. When you make something illegal, it became very profitable, and alcohol became extremely profitable. There. We've talked before about immigrants with reasons for prohibition also, but just a reminder when, when that comes in here. Eventually, we will have the 21st Amendment that will change the 18th Amendment. This happens early in the Great Depression, um, and that part of the reason was to get taxpayer money at, at that time. But many of the things were successful. They, they are, we, will, we will end up having a less alcohol that is consumed um, after the 21st Amendment than before the 18th Amendment was in, in America. Um, and a lot, and there, were, there were a lot of positives of prohibition. But again, that the, the organized crime will be the one negative that goes above it all. So again, that's more trivia for, for you all. If you're AP class, make sure you definitely know Volstead Act. And then Al Capone is as one of the best examples. But remember, realize there's organized crime everywhere um, here. So different 20s slang to know, and this is where I kind of go in the story, talk about some of the, the local things here, um, and, and where we ha had, had people, and where you have wets and dries. Wets were people that were for alcohol, dries were against it. Today we still have in the mountains of North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, there are still some dry counties all right, where it's illegal to sell alcohol there. Bootleggers were people that would would illegally transport alcohol. The name comes from where they'd hide a, um, a bottle in their boot. Rum runners, that was something for here in Florida, New Jersey also, um, there where there were people that were using boats to transport the alcohol. Florida with Bahamas so close and other places like Jamaica close enough that where rum that you could have in the boats. Uh, much like the bootleggers with their cars where they have souped up cars, the, they would have souped up boats trying to run it. A speakeasy is a secret bar. Uh, bathtub gin is homemade alcohol. It doesn't have to be gin. Hooch was just a different name for different different type of alcohol that you would have here. Again, speakeasy is one that you definitely have to remember and know with this. All right, for women in the, in the 1920s, and this is where it was a new era, at um, the 1920 election will be the first time that women vote. Republicans and Democrat um, were really scared that that Alice Paul's um, National Women's Party would would emerge um, as a political party, not just fighting for suffrage, and that if all the women were in one party, then the Republicans and Democrats were split, then they would they would end up being in power as women. Um, so both Republicans and Democrats did a lot of things trying to lure them in. I have that example, the Shepherd Towner Act, that that they would that they were trying to have, have women um, and, and issues that women would care about. Um, that would decrease uh, quickly because both Republicans and Democrats soon come to find that women will end up joining more of the party of either their husband or their father. And still today, 85% of people are more likely to vote what their family um, was that they had. The, the, going back to Alice Paul, and we had this in, pro, in the progressive unit there, after women got the right to vote, she will fight for the Equal Rights Amendment and what is the second feminist movement. Um, that will kind of fade away for a little bit because of the Great Depression and World War II. It'll come back in the 60s, and this is where we will see when we have the vote of whether or not to add the ERA to the Constitution, which, spoiler alert, it doesn't get added. We'll discuss why and what, what the reasons were for that. All right, flappers. Uh, here's where for a lot of you when you see flapper you're just thinking of fashion it's not flat fashion it is a fashion style uh, with a flapper dress and that but here's where you need to think for the 20s it's an attitude it's the idea um, there women are liberated they're more independent they're more free thinking um, here so again not just with dress although that would be prohibition effects I I kind of gave a little story about how, I mean, women that actually will end up being more likely to drink once it becomes illegal than before, and it became fashionable for, for women, but where in the Victorian time periods, all right, a proper woman would never be seen in a bar, but now you've got women that are going to speakeasies that, uh, there. So men, since the downtown, or since the pub at the end of the corner of the street has been closed down, they would have some bathtub gin or some uh, that they got from someone at work or something like that, and, and they would share a, a glass and drink with their wife by the radio and spend more time with them um, here. But this is where for women there's going to be a huge conflict, and in a slide or two I'll have some pictures of even the, the dress, 
and realize how quickly this change was. Um, there, and we'll go back to discuss this. All right, one major thing that happened was Margaret Sanger um, there, where she'll be pushing for birth control. And this is a major thing. If a woman can, change, can control whether or not if she's going to get pregnant, that get, makes it where she's a lot more independent. Um, we're going to come to Amelia Earhart, but, but as an example of a woman that's going to break the stereotypes because for airplanes at that time where they're so, so rough. When I have a video that we show, it's one of the Mr. Best with memes that does a good job telling about what she does and how she's different um, there. And again, something that's, that's not seen for something for a woman. Now the picture on the bottom left is Amy McPherson, and I always like to to bring up this, and where you're going to have a reader about fla reading about flappers. Uh, but Amy McPherson is a preacher, so you see that's definitely not a flapper dress that she's wearing. But she was one of the biggest preachers in the 1920s. She'll use radio, but this is where we kind of have a mix of the traditional with the modern, because. It is modern for a woman to be the leader of a church. Still today, there are churches that won't even allow a woman to be a deacon or an elder in a church, much less uh, to be a preacher um, there. So this is, again, not what you normally think of flappers, where a lot of people think, again, the women, the way they dress, and women drinking and smoking at a higher rate. No, even in something traditional um, like a church and the changes that were made there. I throw this in here because in the 1920s there was a big growth of feminine jobs. Um, you should know the difference between white collar and blue collar jobs, but here's where a pink collar jobs are more the feminine jobs that you think of and education, fashion, nursing, social work. And some of you say, Mr. Bass, um, I think you're on the wrong, wrong side here. Um, think about to your elementary school, how many how many males were teachers there? I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the students from my class went right next door to us in Vernis Primary, and there's Mr. Flaherty, and sometimes he's been the only male that's been there for the last 15 years. I don't think they've ever had more than two or three teachers at a time that were male. Preschool are, are almost always female. So as you get older, there was, there's been more, there's more males. Um, high schools usually are around 50-50, some even above that. Still though, it was seen for, for women that were married, uh, even if they have a college education, that their job was to be stay home, take care of the children, and more of your traditional um, housewife type things. A Boston marriage, this is where it's two women that are living together. This is not just in the 20s, this was actually um, from the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, some people will say that, it, that think of it and think of it as a, um, a gay relationship. There sometimes that was the case, but many times it was just two women for financial reasons that were staying together. All right, this is where I was saying that to kind of look and see, and you see, see the Victorian dresses that we have. I mean, all the way down to the legs. You might remember when we watched Far and Away, and uh, the guys that were going by and trying to get a little look at that that two or three inches of, of sexy ankle skin um, that was being shown when her dress rode up a little bit over the top of her boot. Um, there, so and how the collar, I mean, up at the neck, um, all the way up, and that's what proper women dress. Notice the bathing suits at that time. Okay, if you want to get a tan, basically your neck and your arms are going to get get a tan um, there. But one generation and how much different it was. And you see for the flapper dresses, okay, they they would usually be mid thigh to knee knee length, um, spaghetti straps. So a lot more skin that is being shown, but the legs and the arms. No, the bathing suits aren't skimpy compared to what it will be in the future. The bikini is still 30 years away, but compared to what it was just one generation before. And this is where I say for, for the females in our class, if you were today, go sometimes your grandmothers. Um, if, they were, if your grandmothers were, were ones that were in the late 60s, early 70s, and they wore mini skirts, and they wore a lot skimpier clothes than what, what you, that are currently in fashion today. So... That's not a, cha a change where this was a dramatic change for what women had. Um, again, one generation that you have in here. Again, Margaret Sanger um, to be familiar with, but the idea for birth control. All right, the automobile imp impact. This is another one that I'll show a video of for Mr. Betts where he talks about the Model T and, the, and we watch on America's Story of Us things for about the Model T that you have. But the impact is more than just just the car itself because it'll change America. We're going to have roads that are built all over. We're going to have industries that are focused on on that, like steel and glass, oil that in Rockefeller's early days, that it was literally literally a waste product with gasoline pouring out into the rivers. 
there. Now gasoline will become the biggest thing that, that'll, be, that'll come out of refineries. Um, cars will change more in one decade than I believe any decade ever. You see the Model A and at the beginning of the 19, 1920s, that's still, much, still a horseless carriage in many ways. But by the time we get to the end, and that's uh, there in the end of the 20s, um, when Henry Ford will come out with the Model, Model A because other cars have been become, made so nice, he will then make a lot of those changes. Suburbs are going to start expanding. Um, it has started earlier. They're going to expand more in the 20s, but then the biggest will be in the 50s, and we'll see the impact of the car there. Again, change the landscape of roads. Gas stations are, are going to become common. This is where we have, have another change in history today, where we don't have these small four-pump or two-pump gas stations today. We have larger ones that are, are Wawa's or racetracks that, that'll have 20, 30 truck pumps in there, and this, the small gas station's kind of gone away in here. Part of the consumerism growth that we have in the 20s and the idea that you had to have something would be a car because you wouldn't have the, the nicest car and a car that was better than what, you, what your neighbor had um, there. So that uh, impact is going to go. For Florida, you notice the two different maps. The one is before the 20s, the other one's by the end of the 20s, how many roads were built. Um, and a lot of our roads in Florida were built on prison labor. We there there was the convict system that, that we had. You didn't if you most crimes you didn't sit in prison. You were put to work on um, there. On the bottom left hand um, corner, the ten can tourist camp. One thing that grew in the 1920s and has been around since then was where you kind of think of like a mobile home to, today uh, that that you have or an RV that people are going and the trailers that you have for campgrounds. Um, there, where people could, could come and travel and visit Florida um, here. See here this picture in Hollywood. This is in the early 1920s. Notice that there are more, more of the Model Ts um, that we have at that time. Jacksonville, the next picture is also on the, on the Atlantic coast. And, you, and here's where we have for the, the shell um, shorelines, not the sandy shores that you have on the Gulf Coast, but on that side, and all these cars that are coming and people that are, are visiting in Florida. Um, some of you are thinking of the parking on the beach and how, how um, there with the sand dunes and there what um, turtle. Well, at this time, also a popular meal was green turtle soup. So there's even more things. That's why that, why that would come illegal um, here. All right, airplanes. Now, airplanes had dramatic changes that were done, especially during World War I. That will continue from, during the 1920s. It was still dangerous with flying a plane in the, in the early 1920s. Um, it is not something that people are using for transportation um, like today to go from point A to point B um, unless they had a reason like a mail um, or the crop dusters. Charles Lindbergh though and Amelia Earhart are two people you do need to be familiar with. Um, there, Charles Lindbergh um, wrote, had his plane, The Spirit of St. Louis. The, you see the picture of it if you go to the Air and Space Museum at Smithsonian. You see that as you enter. He will be the first one to cross the Atlantic on his own. Um, and this is where people will be setting records. Amelia Earhart will, will have more and more flights and longer flights. And where I show the video, it tells about how she's able to, to go and the first to cross the Atlantic. She completes 22,000 miles on her, where she's trying to circumnavigate the world before her plane disappears over the Pacific. Um, but this is where for her to, to see, for a woman doing this. But that rugged individualism is something I want to point out. We always have for generations, when we talk about the generation there, that the younger ones, well, they're soft. Uh, they're like, I gave an example in class of me. Back in my day when we played football, Okay, you got a concussion, you just strapped on your helmet and kept playing. Um, there, it's not even football. Was well, there's a lot of things that at that time, you'd have Grandpa talking about how he had to hitch up the, the, the oxen for the wagon and Dad talking about when he had to crank the car and it, um, to get started. Now all you have is the key. Well, a lot of people say that they were soft, but we always have things that are, are taking to the modern, but it's like the old cowboy. And... Charles Lindbergh, show, when, with the, what he was doing and, and being followed and um, there for, for what, it, and showing that rugged individualism. Again, it's kind of like a cowboy in the sky um, that, that you have. People that are astronauts are, are that way that today, um, and they are adventure takers uh, that, that you have. Now, this is before Charles Lindbergh, where we'll, we'll see him come back in the 1930s and where he's part of like the American First Committee and those groups that... Um, and suspicions of is he supporting Nazism um, here. 
All right, something I would like to spend a lot more time on here, I don't, we act um, in the notes um, in it, but this is where by the end of the 1920s, most everybody had a radio, and you, um, and we'll, I'll show a part for about the 1930s and come back to that with the fireside chats of, of Franklin Roosevelt and the impact of the radios. Um, earlier, I, before we had Birth of the Nation, I was talk, uh, in class going about the differences between what happened with the silent film? So once they they had the, the the sound going with it, where you could actually talk with it. Trivia wise, the jazz singers are first talky. A lot of actors and actresses that were great in silent movies, well, they didn't have a voice to go with it. Their career was gone. But this is where our movie palaces. And then what we're going to see is how incredible that Hollywood will make for the movies from the late 20s to the to the to the 1930s. Um, and what changes in Hollywood uh, that we have at that time. And we'll see how the impact was in the 1930s of, of Hollywood. For music and dancing, I show videos of what a Jitterberg, Charleston are. Jazz music will be, will be something that is, again, dramatically different than any time before. The dances, like if you saw the Jitterberg and a Charleston, uh, you would look at that and say, this seems pretty innocent, several things, but it's so much different than what was, again, one generation before, not just the fashion. Um, that, that you have. One thing that develops in America we've had since that time is the youth culture. A lot of things are going to be focused on younger. Don't think teenagers. This is more you think of the 20s, early 30s. My period. As teenagers, y'all don't have enough money. Yes, advertisers are trying to get you hooked, but your main, like even today, the main main group advertisers try, try to advertise for is 18 to 35 year olds. Sports were also big, and this is where for the 20s, a lot of this you see is cultural. Um, before the 1920s, the biggest sport in America since our beginning was horse racing. And it still will be big in the 20s and up through the 50s and the 60s. But two sports will emerge to be kind of like 1A and 1B with baseball and boxing. Babe Ruth was the greatest player of that time, some people say of all time. Um, there. It, again, you can't really compare with it, but this is where he's more than just an athlete with stats, because stats can always be broken because he was an iconic figure and helped the game grow, kind of like how Michael Jordan was for basketball in, um, in the 80s and the 90s that you have. Boxing was, again, one of the two biggest sports, and this is where for Jack Dempsey and had the, the, the fight of the... Of the of the century, even early on, this is where the um, radio, people with radio, people could listen to a boxing match that was taking place in New York, wherever they were, and listen to it live. Same with the baseball game. So that's where radio helped these to grow um, here. Golf, this is where we're going to have Bobby Jones. Some of you may know of him with a master course. There's a little golf match played every spring called the Masters. Um, that is on his home golf course. I put swimming because it, I'm here, and it's part to remind me, a lot of the 1920s were things that and we're kind of repeating history of doing things that are, are fads. Uh, yes, a fad was um, flagpole sitting. Is exactly what it sounds like. You sit on top of flagpole as long as you can. You might say that's kind of stupid. Well, think of some of the fads we've had in the last few years. Think of planking a few years ago. Things say people will do it. Um, why? Because someone else did it. Um, so that's where, again, it's history is kind of repeating its, itself on um, there. All right, the Harlem Renaissance. When you see Renaissance, you should be thinking about the rebirth of culture after the, the Dark Ages. This is maybe not a, a, even a rebirth, but a creation of for African Americans and their their cultural side. Jazz was a great example of this, but there's gonna be art and music and writing that will, will have this. Uh, Langston Hughes is probably the, the most familiar author from the Harlem Renaissance that, that you know. I know a lot of our English classes in their junior year will be reading Langston Hughes. Um, James Weldon Johnson was a poet at that, at that time. A lot of his writings are going to be used in the civil rights movement in the 50s and the 60s. Um, Zora Neale Hurston, I think our AP language class will read her. Um, I always thought that she would be more on the EOC because she has her ties for Florida, for Eatonville nearby. Um, but I think her writing might be a little more complex. Normally when we have a question on this, they might have a poem or something by Langston Hughes, something they could have shorter since it's not a longer point. We had the red scare earlier, and yes, we did, ha we did have a black scare at that time. Now, the black scare, some of this comes about because of the Harlem Renaissance. Again, a lot of the Harlem Renaissance was where it's pride in your culture and writing uh, about that. We have a black middle class that is, that is 
um, rising up in various areas, whether it, whether it be black communities in the south side of Chicago or, or Harlem and other areas. Um, but this scared a lot, a lot of people. Marcus Garvey that we had earlier with, with Du Bois and uh, Booker T. Washington, but this is a time that his United Negro Improvement Association was organizing. Now, not Mer many Americans wanted to go back to Africa as, as what he was trying to as an international thing, but his idea of black pride and black nationalism, which a lot of those ideas are going to be carried on in the 1960s with some of the separatist groups that we'll have. Um, there, but that'll scare a lot of, of non-African Americans that are worried about where are and what's going to happen. I mean, blacks were supposed to have their place in society, and obviously the Klan, which is growing at the same time we had earlier, this will be something that they're they're opposing um, at this time. All right, another group of writers is the Lost Generation writers. Uh, most of you will end up in high school probably reading The Great Gatsby or saying something The Great Gatsby of uh, the time. Now, what they are writing about, and we have various writers like the Transcendentalists before, we will later on have the Beatnik writers uh, there, but usually when we get to a time period that seems very superficial, writers will write about that um, here, focusing on materialism and how much people are just conforming um, here. So. Fitzgerald uh, with the Great Gatsby is the most uh, is the most familiar, but Sinclair Lewis, um, if you were to read Babbitt, actually would probably be one of the better examples of it. Uh, for Ernest Hemingway, this is where most people don't think of Ernest Hemingway with the Lost Generation, but some of his writings were that way. I mean, Farewell with to Arms is is one of the the ones that could kind of be lumped in with the Lost Generation writers. Um, there again, kind of a criticism of the time period. Meanwhile, we have this reaction uh, of people that were against a lot of the changes in here. And the Fugitive were Southern writers that were writing against it. Uh, what I like to, to bring up here uh, that, that sometimes looked a little different, Bruce Barton, where business had grown so much in the 1920s. Um, he, he wrote there basically that Jesus was a business person, kind of like a salesperson, and the parables were ads. Um, there, the twelve disciples were actually twelve salesmen working underneath them, almost not, almost like a pyramid scheme that they have. And again, this is kind of this questioning of traditional things that that um, a lot of the lost generation writers would sometimes have. Um, this time period, uh, an architect that you need to be familiar with is Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, here in Florida, he designed designed some of the buildings that are at Florida Southern Southern College. But this is where will probably be one of the most famous architects in, in U.S. history. And this time period, he emerges. For our artists, uh, we have Georgia O'Keeffe. Now, like our other times that we had arts, arts like um, in, in, for our U.S. history, Except unless they're visual arts with a movie um, and motion pictures, we're, we weren't really seeing for the artists on certain things unless they were usually some sort of um, landscapes. Well, she's still in a natural scene. She's best known for her flowers um, there, but for uh, several decades, she was probably the top artist in the United States um, there that we have. All right, I told you about the conflict we have, urban rule, traditional, uh, modern, religious, um, what, the one thing that usually shows the most with this and the, is, will be the Scopes trial. What had happened was the state of Tennessee had outlawed the teaching of evolution in the schools. There was a teacher, John Scopes, who will then teach it. Um, and there's no doubt that he taught it because he said he taught it. Um, but we will have a national trial that, that we will have news reporters from all over the, the nation that come and report on this. Um, the, the person that's going to be the prosecutor for the state will be the former presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan, who's kind of representative of the everyday man. Um, the defendant, will, uh, or the person, the lawyer's going to defend them, and we're going to have the ACLU, which is the American Civil Liberties Union, um, that's going to come about, and it's going to be Clarence Darrow. Now, here's where the, the thing that we're going to have it will be fundamentalism, and for for... For Clarence Darrow, who knew the Bible very well, um, and he would be able to quote Bible verses that would contradict Bible verses that William James Bryan would say um, in here. And again, the, the trial was not so much um, about, about evolution and did John Scopes have it, but should, should this be done? 
and ultimately what will happen is John Scopes is guilty, he's going to be fined $100, but until, until, the last, until two decades ago when the state of Kansas would have it, um, evolution would not be outlawed to be taught. So it's kind of that battle that, that you have. And fundamentalism, when you see the word fundamentalism, like for, if you are fundamentalist with the Bible that you believe it directly um, here. So like I know where I've, I've heard um, at, at various churches I've been, that some will say, well, the seven days of the creation, the days were not 24 hour day. But if you're a fundamentalist, you'll say, yes, it was 24 hours days. Um, there, so that's where we'll have this this battle. Um, while we have flapper attitude, we have prohibition, and we it looks like America um, is going going where it's maybe not as moral. Um, there, we will have a revival and a rebirth of the churches. This is one of our great awakenings in American history, and churches will grow. Now, the churches change a bit. Um, two preachers you need to know of. Uh, we had Mamie McPherson before, but you see the pictures of her on the right um, there where uh, as a female, and again, a more modern and, and a change with it. Billy Sunday, which we'll have a video of him with one of his preaching, where he was very much, he was a reformed alcoholic, and he was one of the biggest pushers with the church trying to have for prohibition. Um, a former baseball player, but a little different style of preaching. I mean, you see the pictures on the left one, well, he's almost climbing up on, on the podium in there, but very dramatic in um, the way that, for where he was speaking. So we will have a rebirth in religion in the 1920s also. Again, the Scopes trial, sometimes called the, the Scopes monkey trial um, there. So, All right, for Florida, um, this part isn't really in your nose, but Florida will have a huge land boom in the 1920s. It started, a little bit earlier, World War I, when a lot of rich people were not able to go to the Mediterranean, they will then start coming to Florida. 1924, the state of Florida will pass law that says there's no income tax and inheritance tax, and we're still one of less than 10 states in the United States that do not have an income tax. But at that time, it was very attractive for rich people. Still today, it's a reason that some come to it. And so by the time we get to the middle of the 20s, the land boom has just increased dramatically. We're, trying, we're building more railroad lines, more roads, trying to get the people here. Charles Fisher, who was basically giving land away for free in Miami Beach, which today, I mean, some of the places he gave away for free are, are worth millions of dollars uh, for just little parcels of land um, in here. And what, what happened, though, during the, the mid-20s, as people kept coming, and Miami was just a place that people were buying lots un sight unseen. And you could buy a lot in the morning and sell for maybe twice as much that afternoon. Um, so, but what else may happen is we are going to have this boom turn into a bust, and whoever was holding the paper last lost, um, and it'll have. Here's where we have for the largest pay paper in the history of the United States, um, when there was maybe almost all advertising for lands in 1925 down in Miami. Um, here. Florida, this is where we're going to have for different parts of Florida. Uh, Miami is going to be known for the new rich um, there, the exciting, the place at. West Palm Beach is going to be the old money, maybe a little more conservative, but this is where the, the money is going to go. Um, Coral Gables is going to be started by, by George Merrick at there. William James Bryan will actually go, and he's hired by him to sell, sell for him. One of the first women in, in, um, in in government for state of Florida will actually be William Jennings Bryan's granddaughter um, in the 1920s and 30s. So there, Palm Beach again. We're gonna have if you know of Singer Island, exclusive island off of Palm Beach um, there, and this is where a lot of the rich will come in there. Hollywood is going to be made um, closer to us. If you go to down to Tampa, Davis Island over by the convention center um, that was being developed in um, this area, and someplace for rich. We had people that were showing up, and basically some of the areas we would just go, and there was a planned development, they would just clear land. Uh, if you're in our in area of Homosassa, where like the fire station, the park is, they, that was where Homosassa was going to be a bigger place in here. And this is where northerners were coming down, and even before they come down, they were buying, again, a lot of this unseen. Uh, Everglade Club will be kind of the start uh, of things for a lot of the money in Miami. Here's an example of a place they just started, they just built basically this developed those houses there, and this is where in Venice. So everything's just being set up um, there. And, and again, people were buying these uh, sight unseen in here. 
We will stretch what was Highway 41. It was called the Tamiami Trail. So you put Tampa and Miami together. But the hardest thing was, is how are you going to get across the Everglades? We will have, which environmentally was was a horrible thing where we will end up, basically you see they dig a, a canal, use that dirt to dig up. In the past several decades and really speeding up now, we're, we're pretty much tearing that down and building it more as a bridge so the water for the Everglades can flow through. But that was seen as a great advancement at that time and you could cross across from Naples to Miami then easily. We will have, again, the trading uh, of these things, just trying to um, have this. But what will happen in 1926 is suddenly the bottom fall, falls out. Soon after that, we will have the first hurricane hit, and that will make, make a drop even faster. And by 1928, when a second hurricane hit South Florida, um, Florida is deep in the Great Depression um, there, but, and before the stock market crash. See here, I mean, just look at Fort Lauderdale, different from 1920 to 19, uh, 2019 and how different the development is there. Here's one for Coral Gables. Okay, the 2226 hurricane, uh, this is before we had names for hurricanes. Uh, it struck Miami pretty much directly. Today there would be probably seven, eight million people that would be affected um, if, if a hurricane was going. 98, two people were killed there. Uh, Moorhaven, um, the, the dike around Lake Okeechobee will end up crushing and the lake will end up flowing over and drowning people um, and the little town of Moorhaven on the edge of it. Um, again, this will basically, for Miami, will, a lot of things that were built um, for the smaller houses and all were completely destroyed. Uh, West Palm Beach was not affected as much for that one. So a lot of people in the Palm Beach area thought, okay, well, this is, this is good in here. But they will get theirs because 28, the hurricane will hit more and go to West Palm Beach. It'll cross across um, and go, and it's a very large hurricane. It will once again hit um, Lake Okeechobee. The dike will break again, which um, in one place, a little place called Port Mayaka, close to where Indian Town is today, uh, there, there will be thousands of people that die. We don't even know the exact number. A lot of them were workers that were working agriculturally. Uh, they could not get to the bodies for several days. And if you know Florida heat and September, um, it's not some place that if they were sitting in the water and heat for several days and the smell that they had. So they had mass graves for most of those people. During the 1930s, then we will have what is now called the Herbert Hoover um, Dyke that was built around Lake Okeechobee. It is nearly impossible to see Lake Okeechobee because the dike completely surrounds it. Uh, when I say, how is it today? Well, it was built 90 years ago, um, or close to 90 years ago, not, not 80 to 90 years ago. So um, there are some places on it that, that really need to be fixed right now. Um, here's where some environmentalists say that if we were to have a major hurricane and a storm surge, that that could cause problems. It's one of the reasons why we've had environmental problems the last couple of years of dumping a lot of water out of the lake um, in the in the late summer, early fall, just in case a hurricane came, so that it's because they're not sure if the dike can handle it. So, so we don't want to have happen what happened in the 1920s, where people died, where the dike breaks and thousands of people or 100 people in some towns get get drowned by it. So.